You are listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast with Maggie Green, episode number 292. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast, a podcast that celebrates cookbook readers, buyers, collectors, writers, and clubs. And now your host, cookbook author, culinary dietitian, and cookbook writing coach, Maggie Green. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. How's everybody doing today? Hope you're all doing well. And if anyone listening has been in the path of the interesting weather system that has been going through the northeast part and the south part of the United States over the past couple of days, I'm thinking of you. We did have some tornado warnings here in Kentucky on Tuesday evening and some pretty severe weather that went through the state. We are fine in our part of the state, and we did spend a couple of hours um, in the basement. This is kind of typical for April, though, here in Kentucky. I will say that is the one kind of weather that we do have to watch out for and be alert to and aware of. I know there's been a lot of snow in parts of Wisconsin and Canada, and now even up into Vermont and Maine, a lot of rain all across the um, eastern seaboard, so I'm just thinking of everyone. We returned just in time, actually, from a trip to Chicago. We went up last week to visit our oldest son, and we drove up on Good Friday, attended a Good Friday service in Wilmette, Illinois, which is north of um, near Evanston and a Northwestern University. Then we spent the evening with our son and his friends watching Purdue basketball. Purdue won, uh, which was very exciting for us since our Kentucky Wildcats are no longer in the NCAA tournament. Unfortunately, they lost their first round game to Oakland and they are out of the big dance. So we've enjoyed having a dog in the tournament, so to speak, a team to cheer for because our youngest son goes to Purdue. He joined us in Chicago on Saturday and we... um, Enjoyed the morning, went to a bakery in Evanston, Illinois, called Benison's. And they have all kinds of Easter cakes and treats that they bake, as well as many different things that they also bake coming up for uh, Passover, which is going to be, I believe, around April 22nd. So, of course, being in the food world, I just love to visit places like that. Benison's was a great place to visit. And then we went and took the train down to the neighborhood where my youngest son is going to be moving to after he graduates from college, spent some time there. And then after that, we went back up to the um, area where my son lives, and we went out for Korean barbecue to celebrate his birthday. And then Sunday, after we went to Easter Mass in his neighborhood, we enjoyed a Greek brunch at a restaurant in Chicago. And then Went to a bar where Purdue fans gather, and we cheered on the Boilermakers again, and they won that game and are now going to the Final Four. So that was a lot of fun, and again, can't wait to watch them play basketball this weekend and hope they continue um, to do well in the tournament. Although I have to say, if you're a basketball fan and you've been watching number 30, DJ Burns, on the NC State team, is such a good player, so fun to watch, and I can't wait to see him match up with Zach Eady um, during the Purdue-NC State game. So a lot of fun still going on for March Madness and basketball, even though it's April and it should be wrapping up soon. Okay, so um, I want to talk the next few episodes, uh, some solo shows I'm going to be doing all about cookbook writing and cookbook publishing from my perspective with having written four books in seven years. And I'm going to kind of break this down into several different episodes. And I'm going to be teaching a free training in May. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that so you can get signed up for that. And I'm going to be opening the doors for the revised and improved version of Get Paid to Get Published in the middle of May. So a lot of exciting things coming up. You're going to want to be sure to stay tuned if you're a regular listener so that you can get in on the registration for the free training 
And if you know anyone who is interested in re- publishing their recipes in a traditionally published cookbook, uh, please be sure to share this information with them, share the podcast with them, have them tune in over the next few episodes, and they can get in on the action as well. Okay, so today I want to talk to you about writing. And I want to talk specifically about writing practices that have helped me write cookbooks. And I think one of the things that happens when people have recipes that they want to publish, they don't always think of themselves as a writer. And I believe that you can put recipes in a cookbook without being a cook because you could get contributed recipes, but you do really need to be able to write in order to put a cookbook together And if you want to get a cookbook traditionally published, you definitely need to be able to write because that means that you have to communicate via a cookbook proposal what your cookbook idea is all about. So writing has always been a huge part of my life. I can't really think of a time that I haven't had a notebook that I am actively documenting and keeping track of things in. But I'm going to share with you 10 different ways that I write in my everyday and every week life here in Kentucky in 2024 and how this fuels the day that I have, the work that I do, and the life that I live and allows me to be not only a business owner, a podcaster, an online uh, coach for cookbook writers, but also a prolific cookbook writer. I've Published four books in seven years. I have another cookbook that I'm working on now that's going to be a self-published Christmas cookie book. And then I have interest from a publisher to write another book for them. So writing and publishing is just something that I do. It's just the way that I think about myself. And if you're not quite there yet, the secret is to get yourself to think about yourself as a writer by actually developing some writing habits and some writing practices. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so number one, every morning, I've maybe said this on the podcast before, but I get up, go to the bathroom, get my cup of coffee, and I go sit down in a certain place in my house that I have set up for my writing. It's quiet. Nobody is awake. Um, There are not as many people living at home now, but that doesn't really matter. I still get up at a time, wake up naturally at a time before Um, My husband wakes up and I have quiet in the house and I go sit and I write my morning pages. This is something you've maybe heard me talk about. It's a uh, technique and a tool that Julia Cameron uses. Julia Cameron is the author of the book called The Artist Way. She also wrote a book called Write for Life and morning pages are the main tool that she recommends for creatives who want to be more creative. And so for my perspective, I use it as a tool for a writer who wants to write more, as a cook who wants to cook more, as a coach who wants to coach more, as someone who runs an online business that wants to do more of that, more podcasting. um, This is the tool that I use. And it's essentially very simple. All you need to do is get a pen and a spiral notebook or some kind of a notebook preferably a notebook that you don't mind, obviously, uh, using up quickly and writing in every single day. Um, Spiral notebooks for me work the best. And you write three longhand pages every morning. So I finish my morning pages. It usually takes me about 45 minutes. Um, That means that we're writing about 15 minutes for each page. And this is just stream of consciousness writing. I'm not writing about anything in particular, although I do in the first part of my writing, I'm kind of go over like my main purpose in life. I have a a phrase that I write down for that, like what my mission is in my life. I have a phrase for that. Then I really spend the first page just like uh, thinking of everything over the past 24 hours that I'm very grateful for and that what is going on around me at the time. Sometimes this ends up being repetitive, but I kind of do this little update in my mind to get me present to what's going on in my life by looking at what's going on around me. 
and what's in my mind that I'm thankful for. Many times this involves like describing what my cat is doing. My cat is usually always by my side. He's either eating food out of his food bowl in the back room where I can hear him, or he's sitting right beside me giving himself a bath. Sometimes he's laying beside me snoring. Um, Sometimes I'll describe uh, what I might hear around me. Sometimes I'll describe um, things that I am, again, thinking about or grateful for. But this is just the way that we use morning pages, those of us who do it, and the way that I get myself present to my day. And that usually takes up about the first page of uh, that I write. The second page then kind of goes more into um, more stream of consciousness, just what's on my mind, what I'm thinking about, maybe some thoughts about the day coming up, what I have to do, what I'm thinking about doing. Um, about halfway through that second page, I've drank my first cup of coffee. I get up and I go get a second cup of coffee. But I come right back to morning pages. I finish my second page. And then I use my third page to kind of think about the future, to do some future-focused writing, Um, things I'm envisioning doing, things I want to do, ideas I have. And by the time I do all of that, I usually am finished with the third page. Again, it takes me about 40 to 45 minutes. And I do this every single morning. If you read Julia Cameron's book called Write for Life, She'll talk to people who are her writing friends and they'll say to her, hey, I'm stuck or not much is going on in my life or I'm not doing anything new. And the first thing she always asks them asks them is, are you doing your morning pages? And if they say no, she says it's time to return to the page. So I love the way she writes prolifically. She's published a lot of books. I admire people that do that. And I have... Uh, Embrace this tool fully in 2024, and I've been writing uh, morning pages every day. Was doing it even before that. I wasn't as faithful as I decided to be in 2024, and it's been an amazing thing. The first quarter of 2024, um, I had a significant jump in the revenue for my business. I had a significant boost of energy related to the work that I'm doing here on my podcast. I had a significant uh, burst of energy offering VIP packages inside my Get Paid to Get Published program and getting ready for cookbooks on KDP, and I attribute all of this to Morning Pages. So if you're not, if you want to write a cookbook or if you want to write more or if you want to see yourself as a writer, I highly recommend starting with Morning Pages. The second thing that I do then that is a writing practice is I have another notebook that I use for a book that I'm working on about the inner life of writing. I don't know what the, that's my working title for the book, but there is a life that we all live inside of us that is either propelling our projects forward or slowing us down. I've realized over the course of my professional and writing life that there's very little that ever stops me from doing things that I want to do except myself. Now, emergencies come up, you know, I would have had sick kids, maybe um, something happened that I couldn't do my work, maybe I got sick a couple years ago, I got COVID and I couldn't show up to the coaching call one day, but um, that happens to me very rarely. Most of the time, if I don't meet a goal or if something gets in the way of uh, progress that I'm making, it's usually myself. And the book that I'm working on is going to talk all about that. So I have a notebook dedicated to the essays and the passages and the outline that I'm working on for this new book. And I write about 300 words minimum a day on that project. Now, just to give you some context for the size of the way that I write, I use a notebook. I do my first draft by hand. That's usually about uh, the front page of an eight and a half by 11 spiral notebook. The front of a page is what I mean. If I were to really be in the groove and I do the front and the back, that's about 600 words. Um, I've counted, and so far in 2024, I've written 27,000 words by writing 300 to 600 words a day for the past 90 days. And I didn't, I wasn't even faithful to that every single day. There was a few days that I was traveling and I was a house guest. Um, at one of my sisters. I didn't actually write on those days. But I want you to think about the power of 300 words a day 
for 90 days. That's 27,000 words. Um, just to put this into context, a lot of times novels are maybe, a nonfiction book might be 50,000 words, a novel might be 50 to 70,000 words. Some novels obviously quite a bit longer than that, but 50,000 words is a pretty good, uh, decent sized book. To think that I've already written the first draft 27,000 words just in writing 300 words a day just dumbfounds me. So I have my morning pages and then I have my daily writing practice for a publishing project. Number three, I write all my podcast scripts. Um, if I'm doing a solo show, I handwrite them all out in a notebook and then I put uh, the abbreviated version of it on the show notes that you see below the podcast today. But I have a practice every time I write, I do a podcast to write out the notes for my podcast. That's a practice. Number four, I send two emails a week to my email list. There are perhaps some of you listening to this that get emails from me. Um, I send two a week. Usually it's on, actually I send three, but I don't write the third one. The, the, the first one I send on Tuesday is um, giving you an opportunity to learn how you can work with me inside my program or with me in terms of um, workbooks that I sell or in with me in terms of podcast episodes you might want to listen to. But there's always a very direct and intentional call to action in my Tuesday email. Um, there's some value, but then a call to action. And then for Thursdays, I have an email written that is just 100% something that I think you might find beneficial or valuable related to cookbook writing. And that comes out every Thursday. So I'm able to easily write emails as a writer, and I do that twice a week. The third email I mentioned is actually a link to the podcast for the week. That's set up automatically in my um, CRM system and through an RSS feed. So if you get that third email, I don't actually specifically write that one. It just kind of picks up all the information from the podcast and automatically sends it to you. Um, number five, in my kitchen, uh, every week I write out what I'm going to cook um, in my kitchen each week. I usually go to the supermarket on Thursday, so I'll sit down with a notebook that I have dedicated for the trips that I make to the grocery store, and I'll write down what we're going to eat the night I go to the grocery. The next night, I actually put seven different entries because there's seven different days. If I know we're going, not going to be home or we're going to be traveling or we're on a trip or whatever, if we have plans with friends maybe to eat out, I just, you know, would document that there. But I do actively have a practice of handwriting out my weekly menu. I also um, handwrite what ingredients I need to buy. Um, I think that for me, menus and ingredients are keys to cookbook writing things I always need to keep myself immersed in, even when I'm not actively writing a cookbook. So um, writing my weekly menu also is something that I'm very faithful to. Um, number six is I love to write notes and take notes when I'm reading. I read a lot of nonfiction. I read books about writing. I read books about routines. I read books about business. I read, obviously, some cookbooks still because it might be people who are coming on the podcast. And then I also love to read books about spirituality, some of the Catholic uh, church fathers, church mothers, and I'm writing like that. And I love to take notes. So I have a notebook for notes that I take when I'm writing. And again, I just use a spiral notebook, but it's a way for me to annotate and keep track of some things that I'm writing. It might be a quote. It might be a passage. Um, but I think this is a really great way to kind of see yourself as a writer in terms of the connection with your pen to the paper is to actually copy or keep track of passages from books that you like to read. It's very simple. You're um, literally copying down what someone else has written, but there's still a great connection that's made between your hand and your brain and your eyes and your reading. And if you're trying to get into the groove of thinking about what to write, um, just keep track of passages and books that you're reading. Now, if you're listening to audiobooks and you don't actually sit down to read a book 
uh, like a physical book, you could listen to an audio book and take notes. Um, it's one way to slow your body down, not do quite as much multitasking. I think one reason we read so many books or we say we do when we're listening on Audible is because we're multitasking and we're usually doing something else. Uh, but if you were to write down some of the stuff you hear on Audible, again, it would be a way to uh, slow down, really focus on what you're listening to and write at the same time. Um, number six, when I'm taking a class, I'm in a coaching program right now, when I am on the calls and I'm listening to other people being coached, I'm always taking notes by hand. So I have a notebook that I use that's dedicated to that coaching program, and I keep track of the work in that program in a separate notebook. If you're starting to see a theme here, it's actually true. I order uh, the Mead 100-page college line notebooks. I think they're the five-star single-subject notebooks from Amazon. They come in a pack of six. And I always have a notebook for my morning pages, for any future book that I'm working on. I have a notebook for any coaching programs that I'm in. And uh, and I have a notebook for any notes that I'm taking or want to keep track of quotes or things like that. And then the reason I use these notebooks is because they're not terribly expensive. I can write on the cover of the notebook what it's for. There's even sometimes you can color code them if you want to use certain colors for different types of um, things. But I think if you were to talk to anybody that lives with me or spends time with me, they'll know that I always have, you know, different kinds of notebooks going. Um, just what I do as a writer. And that's what I'm sharing here in this podcast. Um, so that's my notebook for when I'm taking classes or in coaching programs. Number seven, if you're ever stuck, like kind of in a food rut and you don't know what to do or what to cook, um, and you're not sure what to write and you want to maybe, you know, kind of get present to something and spend some time with your pen and your notebook, something that I enjoy doing, and I've maybe mentioned this here before, is going to Yelp, picking a random city. So let's say I pick Austin, Texas, um, search for restaurants in Austin, Texas, and maybe a particular style of restaurant. Maybe you want to look up barbecue restaurants or if you want to look up um, uh, ethnic restaurant in Austin and go to re the restaurant's website and read their menus and use their menus as inspiration to write down outlines of recipes that they have on their menu. And a lot of times menus are lit, written like this now. It'll say, for example, if they have a house salad, they'll tell you the kind of lettuce they use, the type of vegetables they put in it, if there's any fruit or nuts or toppings, and then the type of dressing that they have. Um, and you can write out that particular salad. You can make your own menus from the ingredients in the that they have. Maybe you can make up some recipes. I just think that reading restaurant menus is, for me, one of the most fun, joy-filled things to do that's kind of a mindless activity that keeps me connected to food and keeps me connected to writing. So give it a try sometime. Maybe pick Spokane, Washington, restaurants in Spokane, Washington. Uh, pick, um, you know, a mom-and-pop diners in Spokane, Washington, go to their website, read their menus, and start to really get inspired and think about the kinds of things that they have on their menu. Um, tons of restaurants, obviously, all around the country, tons of different types of places. If you're into baked goods, you can do the same thing for bakeries. I think it's a great way to see and keep track of how restaurants are pairing flavors. If there's any new trends that are out there, um, I just love reading and writing ideas from restaurant menus. Number eight, I spend time intentionally handwriting cards, notes, and letters to people I care about, people I need to thank, um, my guests who have come on the podcast, if they've shared their address, I always write them a handwritten note. I send birthday cards to my family and friends. I send notes to people who are um, maybe have been ill or if they've lost a family member, send a sympathy card. I think as a writer, um, it's important for me, something I love to do is to continue to write and send snail mail that way. I love to pick out stamps at the post office. I went to the Baltimore Pen Show with my oldest sister back at the beginning of March. 
I had some different fountain pens, different colors of ink, and I love to write um, notes to people by hand with my pens and, uh, like I said, buying different stamps. So that's practice number eight. Number nine is I write and post regular posts in my Facebook group, The Confident Cookbook Writer. If you are not in the Facebook group, head on over to Facebook, uh, The Confident Cookbook Writer, and there's a few questions to answer. It's a free Facebook group. I'll definitely let you in. You can enjoy um, learning from me inside the Facebook group and being in a community of people that are all interested in cookbook writing. So I write posts for the Facebook group once or twice a week. Um, Number 10, I write out every day my schedule for the day. And I actually have a few little prompts that I write. And I used to um, use a planner. I still have a digital calendar. I've talked about that maybe before. I have a calendar on my phone. But I like to write every day a few things that are coming up about my day. And I thought I would share that with you so you can kind of get a feel for the kinds of things that I put down. And I actually just do this um, in a notebook. The first thing I do is I like to um, document when the sun's coming up and when the sun is setting. I I walk every day and I make my decisions about when I'm going to walk based on the sunrise and the sunset. So I look at that. And then I'll kind of check the weather and sometimes I write down the temperature for the day. Um, I got this idea from another coaching program that I was in, but I write down my person of the week. Sometimes there might be someone who's having a birthday or someone who's having a hard time. It's maybe someone who I want to focus on that week, be sure I text them or call them or send them a note. um, And I document down and write down who my person of the week is. Um, If there's a new habit I'm working on, I try to work on a new habit like for 30 days at a time. Uh, My habit this month is to read a minimum of 10 pages from a physical book every single day. I want to become a more prolific reader of books, uh, physical books. So my new habit this month is that. So I write down what my 30, what my habit of the month is. Um, I write down if I, when I'm going to take my walk and then I have little check boxes here to be sure I get um, at least a hundred ounces of water in every day. And the reason I do these things is because this type of writing helps me to set the tone for my day. It gives it intention. It makes me present to the things that I know that are important. And then I write down any appointments that I have. Um, I use, use look at my phone. I keep everything on my phone, but then I make a little list of any appointments. If I have any appointments outside of the office, what time my coaching calls are, if I have any private one-on-one calls, And then I write down uh, my plan for what I'm going to eat that day. Uh, My my meals I keep pretty simple. Um, Breakfast is almost always the same thing. Lunch I usually eat some leftovers from the night before. And then dinner time I've um, talked about my weekly menu that I write for going to the grocery. I also usually have a 90-day goal that I'm focusing on. I've done podcasts about setting goals before. To me, a goal is an outcome that I'm working toward. And I think the best way to think about the goal is like if you're swimming across a big lake or a, and you put a buoy out in the middle of the lake, it gives you a direction toward which you want to swim. And that doesn't mean that you're all the way across the lake at that point, but it points you in the right direction. And that's the way that I look at 90 day goals Um, I like to set 90-day goals, and uh, it helps me to, again, swim in the right direction. So I write down what my 90-day goals are. And then the last thing I do is my top three tasks for today. There are a lot of things I usually want to accomplish over the course of a week. And I can usually get quite a few things done, but I don't do it all in one day. So like for today, I would write down the things that I want to accomplish If I need to write an email or upload a podcast or record a podcast or uh, update a calendar, whatever it is, I have my top three things. And usually this is related to business mostly. And then I'll have uh, maybe one or two personal items that I need to do if there's an errand I need to run or a phone call I need to make. Um, I would put those down as well. But if I focus on just you know, top three things in my work and a couple things personally, it prevents me from getting overwhelmed with a ton of tasks. And I usually can 
like I said, accomplished quite a bit over the course of seven days. And that's my daily uh, schedule that I write down every day. Okay, so let me go through those 10 things again so that you can see the kind of writing practices that I have. I Number one, do three morning pages um, every morning. And then I do about 300 words for a future book project. I write podcast scripts, show notes every week. I write two emails every week. I write my weekly menu every week. When I'm in class for my coaching program, I take notes. I also take notes when I, on books that I'm reading. I write uh, menus from restaurants and look at dishes and ingredients and get inspired from that. I handwrite cards, notes, and letters to people I care about and want to thank. I write uh, posts in my Facebook groups, and I write my schedule for the day. And something that happens when we start to become faithful to writing many different things every day, or at least recognizing what we're writing every day, is we really start to see ourselves as writers. And we once we can have this identity as someone who writes, for some people, it's a lot easier to work on a cookbook project. Again, you don't have to be a cook to write a cookbook because you can get contributed recipes, but I do believe you need to be able to put words together on a page and uh, writing is very good for us. It's good for our brain. It's good for clearing our heads. There's a ton of benefits for me to doing this. I don't think I would be doing it for this long or this much if I didn't find benefit. I know it helps me to be a better uh, person, helps me to be a better spouse, be more intentional with my day, more aware of what I'm eating, what I'm cooking, um, how I'm being grateful for people, how I'm thanking people better business owner, better podcaster, a better friend, and uh, writing really does enhance my life in a multitude of ways. So that is it for today's episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. This is your host, Maggie Green. And until next time, have a great day and keep loving your cookbooks. Thanks for listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast. You can find out more information at www.cookbooklove.co.